Brad Gerlach, welcome back to the show. Uh, thanks, David. It's good to be back and in person. Yeah, for the first time, actually. Yeah. Sure. Our, our connection via Zoom last time was a little spotty. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Relying on the internet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What are you doing in California? Um, I came over to mainly to my dad's remains and paddle them out into the ocean and say goodbye. Uh, so I wasn't able to be here when he passed and, um, collect his things and organize his things and stuff and, um, <clears throat> see if I can resurrect his brand. Uh, and I also came to do a, some coaching uh, and teaching. Well, coaching and teaching are two different things. Uh, teaching is teaching somebody, teaching something new. <clears throat> coaching is helping someone uh, do what they already know how to do at their best, uh, do it at their best. And so uh, I did that for Zoe McDougal at, a, at the U.S. Open and my other student, Taro Watanabe, was first alternate. I was hoping he could get in. Um, and then I've done a bunch of private lessons while I'm here in a couple of business meetings and, uh, yeah, seeing a lot of friends and uh, taking my kids to Legoland, Disneyland. And we went to go see a Padres game. And, awesome. yeah, you know, eating some Mexican food. Oh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> I mean. Um did you already do the paddle out for your dad's ashes? Yeah. Where'd you do it? At Seaside Reef. Okay. It, 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 we went there all the time. Um, I grew up in Encinitas. I moved to Huntington Beach when I was in high school with my dad. And then we, well, I moved back down here with my mother and, and my dad ended up moving back down here um, because he was my, my coach and my mentor and my manager and so every time I went surfing when I was in California, he would come with me. Uh, it, it was three times a day. He would come with me three times a day. And um, he would film me uh, and we'd talk about how to be the best. And uh, yeah, he would try all kinds of different, he would call me in, you know, and I'd, a lot of times at Seaside, I liked to surf there because the inside had like a, a beach break, he kind of power, uh, powerful lefts and rights. And if, if the swell was more south, I would drive up, up to Oceanside. And so it was either Oceanside or Seaside. It was kind of back and forth in those. And then if it was winter times, Swamis and uh, a few reefs over here. So, yeah, but Seaside was kind of the main, main spot. Um, can you tell me what he, what he did professionally? and how he influenced uh, the importance of style in your surfing. Yeah, my dad was a an Olympic diver. He's from Budapest, Hungary. And uh, he def went to the uh, Melbourne Olympics in 1956, defected, uh, got offered a scholarship at University of Michigan and came to the States. And uh, he was the best diver uh, in 59 and 60, he won the U.S. National Championships two years in a row. And, and <clears throat> he told me that all the best divers were in the U.S. Uh, and so it was harder to win the U.S. Nationals than it was the Olympics. He couldn't go back to the Olympics in 60 because he had competed for uh, Hungary. And back then, they even though you, even though he... You, you could do that now, I guess, if you change countries, but um, he couldn't go in 1960. But he went on to um, be, he did water shows and different things like that. And uh, that's how he met my mother. My mother was a, uh, was a professional water skier and a synchronized swimmer. So they met at the water, at the shows. And uh, my mother's really, really good looking lady. And, um, I was pretty handsome too. And, um, so they, uh, but after that, uh, my dad developed the first thing that the pole vaulters jump into, which is called the porta pit. Uh, before that they were kind of 
jumping into sawdust. And uh, so he put this foam rubber together and in netting and all this and then uh, made it three feet thick. And, and then to prove how it worked, he dove off a 40-foot grandstand. And uh, everybody loved the dive off the grandstand into the porta pit. Uh, so he got it. It was around the time of Evil Knievel, and America was enamored with daredevils and things like that. So he's like, "Ooh, uh, I'm gonna." People would start would pave to see him dive off this thing, and so he started developing a whole a whole thing around it. He called it the uh, Sponge Plunge, and uh, Jumpin' Joe Gerlach's Sponge Plunge, and um, two weeks before he married my mother, at, like if you were. If you are opening a hotel or a new a new uh, apartment building or something, you wanted to create some uh, some publicity. He would dump jump off the like eighth or tenth floor or something like that into the thing. And and he, two weeks before he married my mother, he overshot it just a little tiny bit, and he broke his jaw and, and like several bones in his face and lost his teeth and like gnarly, right? And um, so I haven't even really seen the wedding photos because my dad's head was just giant and wow. my mother was pregnant with me and my grandpa was like, you're marrying my daughter, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. you're not leaving her, you know, without a husband or, <laughs> and anyway, uh, so he started to, once he came back from that, he told me, he's like, bah, I couldn't even have a hamburger for like two years. You know, this jaw wired shut and stuff. Radical, radical. That's so he started cause he'd do a swan dive into it. And then he started, what he started to do was uh, a flip and then he would land on his back. And um, he started to do it out of a, after he recovered, he started doing it out of a balloon. Um, and um, he did it 85, it would get 85 feet in the air. And we have photos where it looks like a matchbox. I mean, it, 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 he took photos when he was up there. It's tiny. And yeah. I remember him uh, when I was five, I remember him in a big field with the balloon uh, and, and he would be up at the top and he'd be, directing the people moving the sponge to move it in the right spot. He said he could control his body in the air. Really? Yeah. He said he could control his body in the air with what, if he was a little bit off, he could, he could kind of control himself. Like, and when bungee jumping came, he, he goes, Hey, that's what I did. I just, I used to do it without a bungee. And he's pretty funny. <laughs> he's a pretty cute guy. And, um, and, uh, he did it. The, the big picture, I, I have a poster that he signed all the stuff and it was uh, him jumping at Monday Night Football in, in uh, New England, 1972. There's a shot of him jumping out and you know it, it's a li there's a little logo there. It says Jumpin' Joe's Sponge Plunge and he's kind of standing there in sort of a white leather bell-bottom suit and he, um, yeah, you see there's 70,000 people there or whatever, you know, in the background. It's like... Guy was a superstar. I saw him on TV when I was a little kid. Like, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. And uh, he also had, when I was about five, he was jumping at Knott's Berry Farm and he, um, he overshot on his legs. And so his, he smashed his heels, fractured his leg and his pelvis and stuff. So I remember when I was five, he was in a wheelchair and he had like a, he had like a boot on his f both of his feet and like, you know, I used to bring him food and stuff like that. And, um, so when I was about 10 years old, he started to, he was like, uh, I gotta, I gotta stop doing this. Uh, and prior to him stopping doing that, he was on this evil Knievel TV show, which was evil Knievel was jumping these sharks. Like it was, and, uh, there were other acts within evil. There were five other acts in this evil Knievel TV show. And evil Knievel had actually in practice messed up and didn't make the jump. So they, so they even on when the, it was, it was like a live show. Uh, my dad was one of the, one of the, he jumped out of the balloon and, and it, you know, I saw him on t, you know, TV and, and uh, <clears throat> Yeah, it was, it was, that was before, I learned to surf when I was 10. So it was right around, I, prior to that, I was like, I had to be some kind of star in my mind. Like I had to be a, an actor or I was going to be a musician or I was going to be some kind of, I was going to be a, 
you know, a, a football, maybe a, a quarterback or a wide receiver or a pro baseball player. I, I just was going to be something that was in my mind to do. And, um, and so, yeah, he, he stopped in, in, <laughs> he stopped in 1976, right? Pretty much right when I started to surf and he did a laser light show. He, he, on top of that, he had a one wheel motorcycle that he took to car shows and this one wheel motorcycle he bought from somebody that I, and it was developed sometime in the thirties. You sit inside this one wheel motorcycle and the, the wheel, the way it's designed is you, when, when you go to turn, you stay, you stay erect, but the wheel actually bends and turns this way. It goes like this. Hmm does this thing like this. And um, so, so the wheel's other, larger than the human being. Like it's a, above you sit your head you and sit your inside feet? the wheel. Okay. Yeah. And there's other, I've seen it on the internet. There's other people riding um, one wheel motorcycles, but when they go to turn the whole thing turns with the wheel. So you can't, this one stays, stays vertical. Okay. Uh, when you see where you're seated is vertical. So I have these pictures of him at the, um, in the seventies at, at, at car shows He's, he's displaying his one wheeled motorcycle. And, and so I would go to car shows and then, you know, and then he would do this, he was doing the jumps and then he started doing this laser light show. So the laser light show would be, there was 300 bean bags inside the laser light show. The, the light show would go for like 20 minutes. There was Pink Floyd and electric light orchestra and Tchaikovsky. And, um, it was, you know, and people would just get like super stoned and go, he would, he would take it to the county fairs around the United States. So he had a dually truck and a giant trailer and the dome, it was in a dome and the dome was filled with air. So, the, so, so it looked like a big popcorn, like it was, and he wanted it shiny. So it was like a mirrored kind of mylar and it looked futuristic and looked really cool. And he, he would get out there and tell everybody what it was. And he'd be like, laser, you know, he would go, you yeah. know, 10,000 different laser beams, you know, a, an experience. And he would say all this stuff and money back guarantee. If you don't, you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. It was a dollar fifty, And I worked there. I swept no up. Yeah. I swept up beans and I like, and I, um, <laughs> the, 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 the crazy thing was, people would cut the first people that would walk into the show when it, before it started, you know, we'd have them every 20 minutes. Could never have a 20 minute laser show today. Right. People no, would just be yeah. like tension span, be out the door, but they would be walking in the first people in line to go in and he'd be playing, uh, uh, the cars that, that, uh, let the good times roll. And, and those that as people walked in. So every time I hear that, I just instantly go back to, I lost my virginity in that dome too. Did you yeah, really? yeah. Was, does I, he know that? Yeah, or he knows he? that totally. Uh, he's a, he was, he's a stud. He was, like, but that's another story. But <laughs> that was when I was fifteen. Let's, but, let's get um, to that too. But anyway, as you walked in, people would walk in and go, "Yeah!" and they would grab a bunch of bean bags and and all just and and one person would have like five bean bags and be like kicking back, and I'd have to be the person that would come up and say full buzzkill and be like, Hey, it's supposed to be one beanbag per person. <laughs> they look at me and I was just this little, yeah. like, you know, I was like 11, 12 years old going like, Hey, you know, you're not supposed, I felt bad. I felt like I was, I didn't even deliver it. Like, Hey, one beanbag per person. I just like, I know it kind of sucks, but got 300 people in line and we got it. It was like, Oh, oh okay, kid. Fuck. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, I did, I did the tickets eventually. I did like, you know, I just I'd meet all these girls. And then my dad had these younger guys working for him. And, and my dad had like a young girlfriend. He's like, um, you know, after the whole day was over, he'd go back to his pad with the girlfriend. And I'd be like, I'm going to stay with these guys. This is when I was like 14, 15, you know? And he's like, okay. He's like, don't run the laser or anything like that. You guys can play the music, but don't run the laser. Of course, those guys are like running the laser. They've invited all these chicks back. There's, you know, alcohol and stuff like that. And I built like a little beanbag fortress. And I had three chicks that wanted, but all three of them said, we're going to get you. And I'm like, I just want one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's when, it, and next we, this was in New Jersey at, uh, Hunts Pier and, uh, in, um, 
oh, I can't remember what it's called, but um, right next to one of the piers, he was out on the edge of the pier and the big dome was on the edge of the pier and the next to it was a water slide. And so once it was like really late, the guy, the guys would be like, all right, we're going over to the water slide. It was closed. And we're, you grab a pail of water and make lubricate it, lubricate it, pull your shorts down a little bit. So you're on bare skin and you would fly down this thing and nearly fly out of it. I was so dangerous. If I, if my son was doing something like that, I'd just be s- terrified that yeah, he was yeah. going to fly out of it and get killed. <laughs> just like, you know, and, um, so anyway, that kind of, you know, then when I started to surf and he didn't even pay attention to my surfing until I was about 17 and then told him one day I was surfing all the NSSA events and, and I got on the team that I, that I got not invited back and I just, yeah, I had a tough time. I won and I was one of the better kids. Well, I don't think I was the best kid, but uh, it's one of the better ones. And then one day I just came home and just went, I'm going to quit, man. I just, I, I just keep going to these contests over and over again and I don't win. And I feel like I surf better than the people who win. And I don't think I can figure it out. I, I got, I mustn't be very good, you know, good enough. And he goes, ah, okay, I'll come down and take a look. And anybody who knows my dad or spent time with my dad knows that I can mimic his voice like perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> but so he came down and took a look and 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 watched and I remember getting out of the water thinking that I ripped and I I was like oh you know a little bit cocky you know get like oh yeah I killed it and he's like ah oh, you look terrible out there <laughs> but he doesn't know anything about surfing he yeah. just goes you're waving your arms all over the place and I go I need to do that and he goes no you don't and I go you don't even surf how do you know he goes I know I don't surf. There's something wrong with it. And I was like, okay. And I just, we just, from that day forward, we just kept going back and he just kept learning more and more and more. And then he got these binoculars a friend of him gave that were military grade. So he could, he goes, now I can see, you know, and then he was watching really closely. And then we eventually had to get a video camera because he would say, you do the, you do this one thing that's really good. Like your cuts are really good, but your snaps are really bad. Or like I, he, I was like, what's a snap and what's a cut? Which one is ah, fuck, you know, when you do this, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then we, and he's like, you know, you need to know, you need to know what feels good has to look good. Otherwise you, otherwise you're going to, you'll never be successful. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Then we got the video camera and I re I would remember a certain turn that I did. And I'm like, I can't wait to see that. Cause that felt incredible and I'm sure it's going to look really good. And we were watching the video and then one thing I would do something and it would throw up a ton of spray and I didn't even remember it. And he goes there, that looks really good. And I'd be like, yeah, I agree. And then I'm like, okay, but this one coming up that I remember where I hit the section super hard. I'm like, this is going to look incredible. And I look and it looked terrible. And I'm like, as I'm going, that looks like shit. Like this, he yells like there, that looks like shit. You know? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm going, yeah, I'm going, yeah. He goes, ah, you're just tightening up. You look like you're going to take a shit or something. It's just like, you know, he just was like super blunt. And I'm like, I agree. And so he, this is, he just started talking to me about leverage and power and 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 relaxing and the body that the capacity for power is directly related to how well you can relax and all these physical laws and all these things and 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 lots of things about twisting because of diving twisting and then power and uh, like uh, like and what i learned was that he had a coach and his coach was a special guy that was grew up in a Siberian prison camp. He was Hungarian. He could speak since he grew up there. He could speak Russian and Hungarian. So he actually had to stay there longer than normal prisoners because he was an interpreter for everything. And he, his name's Balin, and Balin was a little guy, and he was the arm wrestling champion of the entire prison. 
and he said all the time, he's just the biggest guy in the bar. He's like, hey, you want to go do this? like this? And he's the biggest guy. He'd be like, Urgh. and he said, is that, is that all you got? And then he just, poof, it's technical. It's all technique. It's the same as surfing. It's not about strength. It's just not. It's, it's about timing. It's about technique. And it's about how well you can connect to the wave. The wave is where the power is. And you, you have to stand on the board in such a way to tap that power for your own joy. Tap the power and then aim the surfboard where you want to go. And m- myself included, all my life, I pretty much have oversurfed. It's like oversurfed every wave I've ridden. Practically, you know. And the ones that I didn't oversurf are the ones that I, like my body was like a symphony. It finally sounded good and so i've been on a lifelong um journey to understand it so that i myself can surf better but also i can help others surf better yeah and so that information that my dad got from balin and he said balin treated my dad like he was uh, uh, his guinea pig. He's like, yeah, he was just... And so when my dad came from Hungary to Michigan, Michigan had the best diving coach in the world or whatever, and he tried to change my dad's style. It was something to do with a back dive. It was like a way that he tucked and kept him... He said he, he, he would do the back dive in a way to where he would keep his arms down, and only at the last second would he go like this and then go in the water. And they tried to make him do that sooner. And he said, no. And then eventually everybody copied my dad. I even saw a note. I even saw a note last week when I was going through his stuff from a former diver, a friend of his diving friend that said, when you did that back diving tuck, we all tried to, we all copied you. And every time I'd watch the Olympics with my dad, because the Chinese are the best divers. He's like, that's my move right there. Wow. So, I have this information coming from Eastern Europe on movement that, you know, Eastern Europe, Russia, ballet, the depth of movement, the depth from years is, is a big nucleus within me of, of, of where I come from with my teaching and all that stuff. And I, I used to kind of be annoyed at my dad when I was younger and like, he didn't show me like how to use a screwdriver and a hammer, like you know, this and that and the other. What he didn't show, like what he didn't show me anything. And then all the time I spent with him, he was teaching me, and that's why I have the confidence to be a teacher. Why I have the confidence to take somebody that I could take somebody and say, if they have the desire and the intellect, of course. Yeah, neighbors doing some lawn care right now we're gonna power through okay i don't even care about it i mean what are our other options right yeah okay it'll come and go i'm sure that's why i could i could look at kelly in the eyes and go i can show you things that you've never even thought of right i can i i i can help you surf better than you already do and i don't know many people that could did have the confidence to be able to look at John John or Dane or anybody. It, it would come down to their desire to want to learn. Not like I'm going to go up to them and tap them on the shoulder and say, Hey, I'll show it. it just doesn't work that way. It's got to be me, the other. You got, you have to come. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a martial art thing that goes way back. Like you have to come humble and be like, I want to learn. So, so, you know, let me back up then. But exactly to that point, when your dad came to the beach with you that first time and said, you know, that looked terrible. How did you, uh, interpret that? Did you get offended by that? Did you in your head think, fuck, you don't know anything. What, you don't even know surfing. How dare you tell me? How did you respond to that? Well, yeah, I tried to do that. Okay. But then his response back was, I know I don't know how to surf, but there's something wrong there. And, and you respect, I don't have the answer. He wasn't like, I have the answer that looks like shit. And, and I was like, 
And up to that point, like no one tells you anything in surfing. No one helps you. I mean, maybe you're lucky and you have an uncle that, you know, or an aunt that, that surfs and, and, and gives you some tips and gives you a few, you know, Hey, don't walk out over there. Cause there's urchins over there or, you know, the rip sucks you out over here. So do this or, you know what I mean? And there's a few tips and a few things, but like his, his was straight, like, you know, and I was like, I mean, I mean to, ha and then fortunately for me, because that laser light show, it was his business. He was trying to do a permanent one in Las Vegas at the time and it just wasn't working out. And he eventually, dude, we were living on my $250 a month salary living in a motel in Costa Mesa and in laughing so hard. I remember in tears of laughter, laughing with him. He's coming from communist Hungary where they lived super poor, stood in line for the bread. And he's going, ah, fuck, this isn't that bad. Yeah. Fuck, we, we ate, we went to the movies and we went surfing. Oh, you know what I mean? It's like fucking, yay, you know, yeah. don't be afraid of it. You know, you got to go for it. You got to go for, you know, go for, go for things in life. And yeah, I don't know what you're laughing about, but I was on like a foam pad and he was on the bed and we were just was laughing so hard. And I remember it's at, after a while of that, I was like, I really want my own room with my <laughs> closet, my clothes. And, but that was a year before I won uh, my first ASP event. And fuck when I won that event, it was, sorry, dude. I just, I, I remember his face was like, I remember looking at his eyes, like, and it was just like, it's fucking so cool to share that with. It wasn't me, it was us. It's fucking awesome. So awesome. And then, um, and then, yeah, he, was able to come to the I mean he just drove me to the beach I mean I went with him all the time like so many stories of being with him and fucking funny so many funny things just crying laughing with him and then he would always tell me God oh, it's so cool we have such a cool relationship and I didn't have this with my dad and you know not everybody has this kind of stuff and you know it's so cool we can share this and I tell that to my son. Tell him how much, how happy I am to be with him. You know, my older son. I'll be telling that to my younger son too, but I'm kind of cruising with my older son more, you know, right now, just he, he can sit in the front seat a little bit. and I'm so happy to be cruising with you. And my dad used to tell me I was a good son. So you're a good son. And I say that to my, I say that to both my sons and for a little while my youngest son I go you're a good son he goes no I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a good son he kept saying oh. I was going to try to prove you wrong by doing something bad <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like okay okay but I love you just the same yeah. you know and um, anyway the adversity and the stuff that I went through you know before I became a champion you know, it gives me that, you know, I remember all that stuff. I remember, also, I remember making a bunch of really, really dumb decisions along the way. And, and they kept me from winning and kept me from being more successful. And I, and I'm, I'm so motivated to, to make sure that my students or anybody I'm working with doesn't make those mistakes, doesn't, I mean, it's a destiny when you make a mistake. So it's kind of like if they make the mistake, they make a mistake. But if I can, but if I can give them a little bit of a, a heads up that, Hey, there's a dead end up there, you know? Yeah. You don't have to listen to me, but I know there's, there's a dead end over there. Don't go that way. Cause you know, you, you, you're going to spin your wheels, but if they go anyway, maybe they get to the dead end and they learn something that yeah. they needed to learn too. But at least I can get in part, I mean, there's so much stuff technically that if they don't learn at a certain age, it becomes a habit and it's a bad habit and then it's really hard to change. So let me ask you about that. Cause you're saying you've over surfed almost, you know, every wave. Yeah. And, um, tell me more about that. Like, why is it that we layer on all this bull crap onto our surfing when really, like you're saying the simplest, 
solution, like the simplest way of doing it is the solution, right? So it would seem like don't add any of the artifice, just keep it simple, stupid and do it right. And you don't add, why do we add all this other stuff on? Where does that come from? Where are those bad habits? How are they developed? Ego. I mean, you got an ego. You got like, you know, I'm going to, I got to, I got to do this. And I read that this and the language of surfing, you know, the, the, uh, William Burroughs said there was a virus in the language, you know, William Burroughs. Yeah. Naked lunch. Um, there's a virus in the language. There's a virus in surfing's language. You know, grip, tear, destroy, bash, fin ditch, blow it out, blow up, fucking knifed it, nailed it, hammered that section, all those things. So everybody's out there trying to hammer it and do that stuff. And um, I mean, when my dad presented that to me, I was like, what are you talking about? That's my joy. I want to hammer the wave as hard as I possibly can. And I, I mean, I was, my situation growing up, I was, without divulging too much, my, I was pissed off and it had to do with my dad not being there. And I believe my mother's side of the family is quite cold but I didn't real I didn't understand that at all. I needed more I needed more um I needed more attention, a little bit more affection, a little bit more uh and my mother was quite young when she had me and there's a lot of neglect and I was, you know, on my own doing a lot of my own stuff and I think I was pissed off about it, but I didn't realize it. I thought it, I, I thought some of it had to do with my dad not being there. But every time my dad was there, it was very affectionate and and fun. And uh, so I got lucky that he sort of lost his business when I was about 17, like when he started helping me because I spent so much time with him and I I got so much from him, you know. And I, uh, But I was pissed off. I got into fights. I, like, I was pissed off. <laughs> so surfing for me was like, the, here comes a section. I'm going to hit that thing as hard as I possibly can. I didn't think about hurting myself or anything. I was just like, I'm just like, I'm going to throw more spray than any other person in the world. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think when that my timing was good, it was cool to watch probably for people. And I know a lot of people related to it and a lot of people liked it, but it's once I started to, to soften and let the wave do the work and position the board more critically, more radically that I started surfing more radical. I was more, I was, I was a, a more free and more stylish. And my dad talked to me about style all the time. He's like, it's not what you do. It's how you do it. And, and, and that's the difference. Cause everybody here on tour can do a top turn and a floater and a cutback and a tube ride and a, you know, the, the, the things that you get scored on, but it's how, how you do that individual turn that sets you apart. And so that's, you know, that's my, my dad used to talk to me. He's like, you know, you know, it's style about style. I go, dad, I can't just tell people, Hey, I'm stylish. <laughs> like it's either I have it or I don't like people notice it or not. He's like, yeah, but that's the, that's what sets everything apart. So I, I, we had lots and lots and lots of talks about style and m- more or less when you, relate style it's how you look and not 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 the land stuff just in the water and how you look in the water is same in diving how you look as when you're when it's your turn to dive and you walk out on and you, the way you walk to the edge of the diving board and and how you project up and in, up into the air and come and do the dive all the way to when you disappear in the water that's judged and how that looks uh, Greg Luganis, my dad coached him for a little while. He said he was the greatest, most gifted diver ever he's ever seen. And, um, and that kind of just pure beauty movement of the human, human form is, is, is very attractive to watch. And when you have surfing, surfing involves a wave. So, you 
you use the wave as much as you can and get as much out of the wave. And that might be the lightest, lightest, lightest amount of pressure on the bottom turn. And it might be twice as much pressure on the top turn, or it might be the opposite, more pressure on the bottom turn because you want to slow down. There's all, there's so much to play around with. And that was what I think my dad fell in love with because surfing so much slower than diving. Diving's like, boo, 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 and yeah, the person's yeah. in the water and he, he would say, dad, that was a bad dive. And I'm like, why? He's like, yeah, I didn't point the toes. And I go, I didn't even see that, but he has trained eye. Yeah. And so I, that's what I have with surfing. I see, I can see, I can see everything. There's, I, I very seldomly see something and don't understand how to do it. Even if I can't do it physically, I see it and I go, oh, I know how that's done. Because I can see what the body needs to do to do it. I, I didn't know that before. Right. But that has also to do with the time that I spent with Adrian Crook doing Inflex, which is his uh, Kung Fu based movement. And he's worked with, he worked with uh, a uh, NFL quarterback, uh, kickers, NHL leading scorer. Major League Baseball players, U.S. tennis team, U.S. ski team, equestrian, golf, and surfing. And um, I taught him a lot, and I still work with him. But his base of what he taught me is the base of wave key. Gotcha. That's how I, that's how I have the confidence to know where the power comes from. But his, his whole his – whole, uh, thing was get train the body so that the body can go into the optimal position of power, which isn't natural and isn't where the body really wants to go, so that we can get in there and be comfortable there, uh, and and so we can use it. So that was first, and I studied with him before I went to Cortez Bank, and so when I rode, you know, fifty, sixty foot waves, I had I I knew I wasn't going to slide out or make mistakes, or I knew I could handle it. And then I studied Aikido. And I worked with another lady who was in my life, just an incredible mentor, former ballet dancer and cello player and sculptor and fifth degree black belt Naikido, Sedona Method practitioner and a Feldenkrais practitioner. And I spent hours and hours and hours with her. And between Inflex and Feldenkrais and Laura McCormick was her name. She passed away a year and a half ago, unfortunately. Just super surprise um those mixed with the you know thousands and thousands of waves i've ridden and the i don't know hundreds of surfboards i've ridden and the different conditions are um what encapsulates wave key and wave key is an evolving ever evolving form that system method to help you control the surfboard and control yourself so that you can tap into the power of the wave and sometimes the waves are one foot but there's still power in one foot waves you just have to there's a lot of power in a one foot wave in the ocean the ocean the movement of the ocean so you have to be light enough and use your skeleton to to weight over your feet to be able to propel the board forward and get going fast so if you can get going fast in a one foot wave it one foot waves become fun and um usually it re requires that you get a specific surfboard for those waves uh but if you're really incapable you end up riding like a really really big board and you can't do anything too too you can't turn sharp you know uh, usually unless you're a very very good longboarder like joel or cj nelson or a number of these longboard guys are really good but that's a whole different skill yeah but anyway it the combination of the dad of my dad adrian and laura and all the teaching from I started 13 years ago of uh, connor parker taro numerous other people um i learned that i can basically help anybody why, how did um, teaching present itself in your life and why did you get involved in yeah, it? Yeah, the, the, the teaching presented itself. You were coaching first, right? Well, no, I, 
I've sort of always helped people, but then I had, <sighs> where's that one? Come? They're drilling, they're hammering, they're. I have no idea. Hopefully it won't last. Yeah. The teaching thing came once it, once it presented itself, I realized everything I've done in my life set myself up to be a teacher. Life experience as well as technical for surfing that I had answers. And I didn't even know that I had the answers until I was presented with, well, what do you do? And I was like, whoa. And I remember after, I think I, one of my first sessions with Parker when he was 13, coming home and telling my girlfriend at the time, I'm really good at this. <laughs> like not cocky, but just like, I'm good at this and this feels good to be good at this because I've been good at, you know, at surfing and it feels good to be good at what you do. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do after surfing. I mean, I know I'm decent at telling stories, but you know. Podcasting wasn't a thing. So, well, you know, and yeah, exactly. And, um, and you know, uh, I'm so passionate about surfing. I, I love surfing and it, and um, it's so dynamic. It's so endless and people love surfing. I love surfing. I love it. And I've been surfing for 46 years and I still love it. I mean, today was, we surfed and it was one foot and I was like, Ooh, I had a really, the way the sun was on the takeoff and the drop. And like, I had this killer moment today. And so when teaching came, I, I, I knew I was like, oh, this is my life calling. You know, this is what I, and this, I could be, maybe I could, maybe this is even, maybe I can be an even better teacher than I am a surfer, you know, that this, because, I, you know, I, I think about Tom Curran, to me, it seems like he's always had it and I've had to find it. Mm. And I don't know if his dad, spending time with his dad, who is one of the greatest surfers ever, one of the first, what Tom got from his dad. And also Joe, his brother, surfs really, really good. Incredibly. And really nice to watch. So I don't know what sort of info, whether it was through osmosis or there were, I know that he, but man, there, he's a man of few words, so maybe he didn't say a whole lot, but maybe that, Maybe just what he did say helped Tom stay, be connected to the way from the very beginning of when he started surfing. And he's because I, I would watch Tom surf all the time uh, on tour, and he would work out. How, we rode the crappiest boards. I mean, with respect, the best boards of the time, but the crappiest boards for the kind of waves we were riding. Very difficult to ride, and the waves were there was no waiting period. No, it was just you're out there. And Tom would start off in the morning with putting his arms down by his side and he would catch three or four waves with no arms. <clears throat> and I was like, he's just working out his timing and where his body needs to be and how his body needs to move to move with the wave. And then once he started feeling the energy of the wave and feeling the power, all stuff, he would, he would let his arms come up and, 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 yeah, he would just surf. He would just surf so good every every day. Every day I saw him, he. he I mean, I never saw him surf bad <laughs> ever. Let me divert slightly. Uh, can you teach style? Can style be taught? Uh, no, <laughs> no. But when your technique gets better and you relax, and what I mean by, I think. Tom was asked this question. Um, I went to go see the, um, <clears throat> I went to go see uh, Searching for Tom Curran, the, the remake or the re bring. Re release. What was it called? The re, what do they call those things? The remastered. Remastered. I, I took Taro with me because Taro really likes Tommy surfing. And, and Tommy was there. <clears throat> and I know Tom really well. Uh, I'd say I know Tom better than most people. He's been over, came over to our, our house um, in uh, when Be 
Bells was on, and he started against hockey the last time and played music at our house and had dinner with us. And, you know, I feel comfortable. I call him up on the phone and, and I asked him actually if he could, if I could use some of his surfing in wave key. And he's like, yeah, of course. And, um, but they, uh, it was my, my former coach's son, Duke Ipa asked Tom, it's like, how do you, like, how, how do you, like, how do you have style or how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you get to be so stylish? You know, that kind of stuff. And I brought my son too. And my son's like five. And the whole time Tommy was talking, my son was going, this isn't a movie. There, where's a popcorn? There's no popcorn here. And I want to go home. And who is that? Like the cutest stuff in your ear. <laughs> oh, I just listened. I wanted to listen to Tommy, but I was just like, I need to listen to my son here because this is funny. Yeah. And beautiful and honest. Because I told him, well, we're going to a movie. So maybe he goes, well, they have movie popcorn. And I'm like, yeah, they should have movie popcorn. They didn't. Anyway, I didn't feel like Tom could really answer the question. But I think I can. And I think a stylish surfer has the ability to completely relax in between the turns. I think what makes for kind of a funky style is when the, you don't relax in between the turns. In between the turns, you keep the tension on. You're you're trying too hard, and the most stylish surfers. Don't look like they're trying right. too hard. And so that's okay. So how do I do that but still do something? That's where technique comes into play. If you know technically how to do a bottom turn, weight the tail so that the board dips in the water, whether it's the heel side or the toe side drive forward which is move the weight from the back foot to the front foot <clears throat> extend the body at the at the at the speed that it calls for and then after the extension relax down to get close to the surfboard and in the opt optimal position to be able to do the turn desired extend again to whatever you feel you need or is right and then relax again extend relax extend and it isn't just linear it's spiraling down it's spiraling up there's no there's no straight lines there's only <clears throat> the surfboard outline is a curve the rocker is a curve the bottom is a curve the fins are curved the wave is sort of a circle there's a bunch of circles within the circles all these invisible little tiny half circles and quarter circles and full circles it's all circles so if there's ever a straight line that's when the board usually digs rail and that's when there's mistakes <clears throat> and that has to do with either looking too far forward having an agenda being too forceful i see it all the time and realize oh maybe I mean, I've said this a bunch, but this really rings true. It's the founder of Aikido said um, his best Aikido was when he's in his 70s because he lost all his muscles mm. pretty much and he had to rely on ki, which is energy. Um, so there's, when you tap into your own energy and you, be, and you are precise with where you put your weight, and that means over your feet because your bottom of your feet are the only thing that connects you to the surfboard and you're precise with it. And then you're swift with getting the weight off of there and you're precise with where you're going onto your front foot and you're relaxed 
you don't need to overdo it. it that's going to be stylish surfing. You're going to like that person surfing. You're going to go, they have a different style, but I like it. That's what I think. So how is wave? What is the design of wave key? Give me the premise of wave key. And then also who is it for? Yeah. Um, is it for John, John? Is it for the novice? It's, it's for, it's for John, John and, and, uh, people who have been serving for a really long time that would like to get better at even, even just a little better. It's for beginners because if you start doing and moving in the right way and understanding that you, you, how to turn and control the surfboard in connection with the wave, like don't forget the wave. That's why it's called wave key. Key is the energy and you harness the power of the wave without struggle or force. That's why you don't have to be a physical specimen to surf really well. <clears throat> you don't really... You, if you're relaxed and you can put your weight on your back foot and you can, then you can put your weight on your front foot and you're mobile. Surfers don't, good surfers don't, you don't look at somebody and go, ah, oh, that person has a surfer body. I'll bet they surf really good. Sure. You can see some people that have attributes of surfing because their lats are usually big in the shoulders, you know, but you can't tell what they surf like. It's almost you if you lined up, you know, a few different surfers. The one that had looked the most fit was probably the one, like the one that looks most most like a model spe specimen, ripped and shows up in the Instagram underwear ads or whatever. That's the one that probably doesn't surf as good as the one that's eating plate lunch over there. Or sure. it's just because it's weight distribution. And ha like they call it hand eye coordination, but it's more like foot eye coordination to be able to aim the surfboard. And it isn't, uh, it isn't intuitive. It's not what you hear, what you read or hear, like wherever you look is where you're going to go. Absolutely not. That is, that's just kind of, that's just bullshit. <laughs> I mean, I know it. I, I look up at the lip and I think I'm going up there, and then I watch the footage, and I go, my board didn't even go where I looked. You know, I, it's 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 how you aim the surfboard, and I have that all in in wave key. So it's wave key is like a journey of of if you're beginning, then it's to learn the takeoff and learn how to take off, and it's not a pop up. The pop, popping when you're a teacher, you realize that words are extremely important. Words bring up images. And if you say pop, the, 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 the person's going to think they need to do some kind of popping motion. It's not a pop. It's, a, it's almost a pull. It's like a pull yourself onto the surfboard. No one ever said, look at that late pop-up at Pipeline. <laughs> no one's ever said that. You know? It just, we don't say that. The pop-up, I think, word came from the... Uh, I, I want to say it's probably those people that came from Wisconsin and whatever, and they went to Waikiki, and you can hear the Beach Boys going, like, "Hey, pop, just pop up on the board," you know what I mean? And and you know, get in this statue position, and you know, ride straight to the beach. You know, what John, John, and Kelly, and Gabriel, those guys are doing at Chopu and Jack Robinson. Those are not pop ups, you know. So let's call it what it is. It's a takeoff, and and then I get into the detail of exactly what to do so that your when your feet touch the surfboard if you can get instantaneous control and it, depending on uh, no one can tell you uh, no one can tell you like do this when this happens do that when this happens that's your own feel however there are technical things to do with your head and how your body and how, basically how your bones and body stack up over your feet to, to make it easy. And that's what I teach in wave case to help make something that's extremely difficult a little easier. I'm not saying easy because it's not easy. <laughs> Surfing is not easy. 
and anybody tells you it's easy or all you have to do is do this or all you have to do is do that, I, I, don't, I don't believe it. But WaveKey is a series of forms or movements oh, well, well, yeah. it's that a, are aligning the body, like you said, kind of correctly, anatom anatomically maybe correctly, to harness the energy of the wave and direct the surfboard. Yes, and the basic forms are takeoff, bottom turn, top turn, cutback, tube ride, floater, and air. And that's in fundamentals one and two. Front side and back side, natural foot and goofy foot. And by doing um, by doing wave key, practicing wave key daily, you build your own awareness awareness so that you know how to put your weight over your feet precisely for what you want to do. And you are the one that, that can tell, well, if, if I do this, if, if I pull my head back a little bit, oh, I get more weight on my foot. Huh. Or if I put my head forward and put my butt back, I don't put as, I don't have as much power. Oh, okay. oh, oh, you're the one that has to keep practicing to build your awareness. I, you don't copy me. You copy me at first just to learn the form, but then yeah. you're the one that, that, that through, your, through consistent practice, just like if you're learning to play guitar and you play once a week and then you got a gig, I mean, good luck. You know, you practice a lot, you know, and then when you gig, you don't practice anymore. So, so wave key is not to be replicated in the water. The water time is purely surfing. You're purely surfing, and that's paddling, duck diving, uh, uh, you know, catching waves, kicking out, uh, making mistakes, uh, playing around in the water, purely surfing. In that purely surfing sp space, you allow yourself to make those mistakes and make things and be playful. You'll be the most open to allow yourself to apply what you've learned. But if you're trying things in the water, you're 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 not honoring the wave for one there's kind of like a bit of if you honor the wave of, and almost i mean it's not to be too sort of namaste about it but each wave that comes to you and you do catch if you can if you can honor it a little bit for one hundredth of a second like oh thanks i mean all right you know it gives you it gives you you're, you're trying to blend your energy in with the wave to get to 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 slow yourself down to the pace of the wave so that when you take off in it, it when you take off on it you can feel it give you the energy to propel you forward not you doing a series of aerobics or you know or you know calisthenics or you just miss it all and you you know when you feel that a lot when i felt that kind of the most was when i was we were beginning to toe surf you know mm. you're you, you come off the ski you're holding onto the rope you're going a thousand miles an hour and you and you let go of the ski and then you come into the wave you just can at first we just go away in front of the wave and be like what oh oop, right up. so you learned how to like slow down slow down slow down slow down until the wave grabs you and then once the wave grabs you you're riding the wave there's like no almost no joy if you're way out in front of it and have no power that's kind of what I felt like I've done a lot in my life, just surfed in front of the power and just like blown it. So yeah, um, the wave key is all developed only from surfing. Uh, uh, the, the, it's developed, no, I should say that more. It's not developed from only surfing, but all of the movements are purposeful for surfing. There's no extra, there's no extra things in wave key that don't, apply to the to to the surfboard to riding the wave right no extra so then i have fundamentals three which is the second year which is a deeper dive on some of the forms the takeoff the bottom turn the i didn't do the top turn i did the carve the front side carve and the back side carve which is one of the most enjoyable turns in surfing and one of the hardest it's really hard to come off the bottom and lay into a huge, you know, accelerating carve, backside and front side. Most of the carves are, are done with too much weight on the back foot to, 
um, and plow the water and end up at no speed and then have to start. So I teach how to, how to accelerate all the way through the turn so that you, you don't, you accelerate back to the pocket and place your, place the board back in a position so that it's easy to drop back in and make the wave. I did, I added blow tail front side and backside, and that can be turned into a reverse too. And I explain that. Um, and I have a layback turn and there's a secret in the layback turn that you can't really see when you watch a layback. And, uh, and I have sequences of John, John, who I called and asked if I could use his, um, surfing. I called all the surfers, um, a, a couple I couldn't get a hold of. Um, but Tommy, Bobby Martinez, um, uh, Dane Reynolds and John, John, uh, Connor, Parker, um, Taro, Max Beach, No Hill. Um, I think I'm forgetting a couple, but uh, Ethan Ewing, I think I have a little bit in there. Um, and uh, so I sort of show their, each and every person has a different anatomy and I show them doing the turn and then relate it back to wave key and then go back to the turn and then back to wave key and do it in parts so that you can, I mean, if you're totally lazy and you want to learn how to do the layback, you can watch it and then you can go practice it in the water. But I don't recommend that because I tried to do that for years and the sections just don't show up when you want them to show up. So you want to be super relaxed. And then all, when the section's perfect to do a layback, you're just, you know what to do. You don't, it's really hard to look for that thing. You know? So anyway, and I also have like a backside, uh, a different backside top turn that uh, one you can apply when you're going really fast and you don't want to lose any speed. And I think that's, yeah. So that's, that's the whole second year. The second year took me 14 months to complete because I'm so detail oriented and just every tiny little detail, it has to match with the surfing so that it, so that it, it you can you can under <clears throat> so you can understand it so you can relate it and go oh I see that uh, and and then yeah it's um the the next step is fundamentals four which is all the all the stuff that happens in between the turns and that's an expert level this is what I've been doing with Taro quite a bit for the last five six years is how to so, once you know how to do the turns, it becomes more about what's the optimal position to be in prior to the turn so that I, so that the turn can be done with, with the minimal amount of effort. So that's when it ends up looking good when there's, when you do something radical, but it doesn't look that, it doesn't look like you efforted really hard. That's the that's Tom Curran. I mean, that's what that's what people love it so much. He just looks like he's just flying and relax, and you know, even the free scrubber one. You know, like you're like you know, you're you're kind of like I wish there was more footage than just the drone. I want to see it from the beach. But anyway, you know, the uh, so there's stuff that goes on before the turn, and there's stuff that goes on after the turn. The after the turn is setting you up so that it's easy to go into another turn. You don't have to adjust and readjust and everything. By the time you do that, you're at the bottom of the wave and you're already missed either a section or you left meat on the bone. And that's usually the, what I watch. I watch and I go, did they leave any meat? When I watch like the high level pro surfers and they, before a score comes out, I go, I look and I go, did they leave any meat on the bone? And I usually say yes and tell, unless somebody get when it's a nine five, it's really easy to go, oh, that was a little, that's going to be a nine five or a 10, you know, like it, that was incredible. And um, usually they leave meat on the bone because they didn't get into the most powerful position prior to the turn. So no matter how strong or how good they are, they couldn't, they couldn't deliver. And then also they, they, they finished the turn in a position that wasn't efficient to go into the next turn and the wave closed out so soon that they, because they're so, because the athlete's so athletic, they were able to, to just barely get a turn off. Like a, a classic example was Felipe in uh, Portugal. Each time he did his backside snap, he was in a position. He was not in the best position to go into the next turn and the wave closed out too soon. How do you learn what I know? 
and he, and he would finish the turn in such a way to where he could get an unhurried turn in. And that's where the big score comes from when it looks unhurried and natural. And so anyway, that's where fundamentals four is going. Um, the way the program is designed, if obviously if a beginner or whatever, an intermediate, most listeners sign up, they start with lesson one and work their way through for somebody like John, John, where does he start? Uh, well, John does need to learn how to do it from the start. So lesson one. Yes, because he, there'll be things in lesson one that he hasn't thought of before. There'll be things that'll be super intuitive. He'll get it right away. And then I would, uh, I would, uh, if he was a student of mine, I would unlock things for him because he's already so good. And I'd say, okay, you know, we could, we could start on a, a we could get to other things fairly quickly, but you first have to understand how to do a takeoff on the, on the land and a bottom turn on the land. So it has a, a flow and a natural movement to it. So just going straight to the top turn or the layback uh, or, you know, or, or any of those things, there's a way of going in it and a way of coming out of it. They have to learn so that it, it has a, um, a, uh, so there is an, a natural, uh, you're building a natural awareness and you're building it within yourself. Yep. You know? um, but I, you know, it's kind of like, does, does a Muay Thai, you know, champion that first does jujitsu, does he start in, in, you know, at the beginning? Yes. He's even though his, uh, a Muay Thai boxing champion would, would, would already have the discipline and understand about the training and understand that he has to do, he or she has to do a certain amount of, to understand things, but probably have a faster moving trajectory to trajectory towards the first belt. Yeah. And then, and then pick up more speed because of that background. It's the same in surfing is if you're a really high, high level surfer, you, you can get this faster because it's very intuitive. And, um, it's, it's also based on, you know, like, let's say the guys down at Shipster and want to, you know, they're doing wave key and I want to go to Shipster. I go down there and go, Hey, uh, Okay. So let's watch some films of ship sterns. Take me through a few waves. Tell me what is weird about the wave that I can't see in the film. And let's, and show me, show me like, oh, well, when you, when you get, when you think you're at the bottom of the wave, you're not at the bottom. There's still two more steps. Okay. So I'll be aware of that. Okay. So I know how to handle that. I, I, I know. And, and I'd go through the whole practice of it. And then after a, a week, I'd go ride it, you know, me and, um, and uh and vice versa i'd see things maybe that they that i could help them with uh, that possibly they hadn't thought of but they could explain to me how to ride that wave before i ever rode it so i would have a higher chance of not eating it i'd probably still eat it but maybe when i ate it i wouldn't eat it so bad because i'd be so committed because i'd you know what i mean there's just like you know it's just so in a way it's a very it's good for surface to not get injured it, 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 you could tweak I mean even in small waves you can tweak your knee you can tweak yourself so wave key, if you put your feet if you put your weight on, uh, over your feet in the right spot you're less likely to tweak tweak yourself because surfing becomes a little easier when it's a little easier it's easier on your body too yeah. so that speaks towards older surfers yeah. that still want to ride short boards that still want to like you know still want to swerve around and stuff yep. yeah well Obviously, I knew the answer to the question of where does John John start, um, but the reason I brought it up was for the listener to understand um, where the where kind of the. Th I know you don't love the yoga analogy when I've used it in the past, but you know, a yogi, excellent practitioner, or whatever the proper title is, would take a class here in Encinitas, and they would go through the beginning of the class through the end of the class, all the kind of forms. Because no matter what level of practitioner you are of yoga, you benefit from each and every one of the forms. doesn't matter what your body type is. doesn't matter. It benefits everybody in every way. And wave key is ingeniously designed in that same way. Yeah. In that the first form benefits the beginner just as much as it benefits John John, you know, and certainly from resetting fundamentals, but also from what you said, which is preventing injury. 
You know, like it, it strengthens these kind of tendons and ligaments or whatever it is that you're going to be using in your body to do the actual thing once you're in the ocean as well. It's a, it's a specific skill development and the byproduct of that is strengthening your body. And ideally you ought to be doing it switch foot. I do. I know. And so that ends up being a huge advantage for your bodies to unwind the repetitive stuff that goes on, as well as, you know, the benefit of it is if you want to take off on a switch foot wave, or you're out surfing, you're, you can do it. And switch surfing switch foot is really enjoyable. You, you don't judge yourself anymore. I mean, you do one tiny little turn. You're like, woohoo. Just get yeah. to your feet, man. Yeah. You know, and yeah, getting to your feet. So, working working on the takeoff on your on your switch foot takeoff is is i mean why do a push-up when you can do a takeoff i mean it's it's just what does a push-up give you i mean a push-up gives you makes when you think of a push-up you know you're supposed to keep your chest and your body rigid somewhat and you push your body up in a takeoff you're not you're not do you you need a surfing you need to have a much more intelligent torso than a push-up your 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 back has to lengthen and and your chest has to has to sink in order to bring your knees up into your chest your chest rises when you're extending so you can get the full power out extending your body so your 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 rib cage and your chest you you need to all have, have a lot of intelligence and uh this is what keeps the hips from getting uh uh um damaged and um yeah it's 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 I mean, it's it's well it's well thought out and it's well um, practiced over over a decade. I've yeah. been doing it, so it's not like, hey, the internet is show now. It's like you can get on there and you know pop on your surfboard and show everybody what you know. This you can make money doing that, and I'm going to do that now because I'm a good surfer. Like you know, it's it's it. There's a responsibility as a teacher to uh, to. Um, I ju- there's, you just have a responsibility as a teacher uh, uh, for whoever's going to take on your method, you know? And yeah. um, I, I, I kind of see it a little bit like shapers in a way. Like, uh, 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 like I don't think it's good practice for other shapers to say that other shapers don't shape well. It's the same as me. I, I don't think it's good practice for me to say anything about any other coaches or technical coaches or people on the internet like whether they're good or they're bad or this now they're, you want to talk to me privately about it I, I i will say you know i that person i wouldn't go that direction because it's going to send you down the habit that you'll develop with that won't be one that you like but you know like it's kind of a uh it would be an endless waste of energy so i just concentrate on wave key my members uh, and the um, and my private students, and yeah, I I feel like um, I, I'm excited about teaching other surfers that are very good that have a lot of that have a lot of experience that might have gotten older and the body starts getting a little bit yeah uh, compromised. Mine is um, I have to constantly figure out ways to fix it and fix things because of my inefficient movement from the past. You know, but yeah, but anyway, um, I, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what we've been able to produce. Yeah. I, I told you t- earlier today that I'm, you know, wave key fundamentals one, two, and three is kind of like the iPhone two or three. And I'm in my head, I'm already on iPhone you know, 14, 15 X, whatever, you know, I'm way out. I'm, I'm really far uh, from all my teaching, but you got to start somewhere. And that's the same with the takeoff when you sign off sign up to wave key it's it's you know you start at the takeoff and i still do my takeoff every day because that's that's the one thing i once i this is the other thing you hear from people it's like people have been serving a long time once i'm up i got no problem once i'm up you know but we want to make it like it's like what happens when the best wave of the day comes to you what happens you get nervous and go i hope i stick this thing yeah i hope everything works on this and you don't want that you want to be like yeah yeah here it comes i know at least i'm going to make the drop mm. and then once you make the drop you're like you might get the wave you might get the best wave of your life or best wave of the decade yeah 
I mean, and that's worth something. Who knows? That's worth something. Really? Um, in wrap up mode, considering our time, um, I have a buddy who's kind of promoting this thing about, he's like, you should interview your dad while your dad's still around. I did interview him. Okay, perfect. And, uh, he's like, you know, you might have a great relationship with him. You might not, whatever the case is like having kind of a formal preparing a list of questions you learn things about your dad that you never would have thought to ask, you know, like who was your first kiss? What was like all these things that would just wouldn't come up in conversation. If you prep an interview, you'd be amazed at what you learn. And of course it's not to publish on a podcast. It's not for any, it's for posterity. Maybe my kid will want to hear it at some point, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm curious now to know um, how that went with your dad, but also now that he's gone, is there anything any questions that you wish that you would have asked or conversations that you wish that you would have had with him? Uh, on my 47th birthday, I asked my dad to come over to my friend's house, put a suit on. I put a suit on. We got, we got a couple glasses of whiskey. My friend was a professional cameraman. My other friend was there so there's four of us there so you recorded it i filmed and recorded it and it went for two hours and then we went to dinner and my dad said a few things on there that were like he didn't know what it was at first and then i asked him about growing up and and the olympics and you know diving out of the balloon and were you scared and were you this and were that i asked him all these questions and when we finished the only regret i had is not doing a part two mm. and a part three and stuff because we have when we were finished he goes oh this is cool yeah yeah let's do it again he was like interested in doing it again and i wanted to do it again too and we just didn't you know this life yeah picked up and i got married and look my dad came to my wedding my dad loved my wife so much my dad got to hold my first son uh he um came to my first son's birthday uh my son's first birthday uh he took interest in taro and max my students he i got so much time with them so much quality time and i feel super grateful and i even though you know it it makes me sad a little bit thinking about things you know wish i could hug him and all and i wasn't here when he passed which is just <laughs> bewildering but uh i i still am so grateful i had such a long and and awesome relationship with him that uh, um you know i feel like i could i feel like i could ask him a lot more questions well for but, those of know. us who do still have our dads around who maybe consider having these that conversation with them is there any line of questioning that we should focus on? They, yeah, yeah. Just ask him about the past, how his, how he came to think certain things, and you know, just just stuff. Just start asking anything, and what'll happen is when he's when he's finished with the when you're finished with it, go watch it and write down a bunch of you'll get a bunch of Follow ideas up. that you're like okay let's do a part two and let me ask more detail about this point this point and this point and and you know what why not do like a four-part series you know like what i wish i had a i wish i had four, you know a four-part series on on him uh because he was so full of knowledge funny anecdotes and all kinds of stuff you know it's just like a treasure chest of stuff you know and uh but i i highly recommend it and i'm so thankful i did do it i regret not i wanted to take him to hungary and um i had only met his brother on skype and his brother looked like my dad it was just oh, a really? bummer the time i went to the time i went to hungary in 94 uh my dad's brother was coaching the um qatar national team the diving team over there my cousin uh it, is the boston university of boston's diving coach and her husband's the diving coach of harvard uh, my cousin was in the barcelona and seoul olympics for diving i like our and she's a teacher i'm a teacher like it's kind of a passed down 
yeah. you know it's Interesting. it's a very kind of and dive yeah, it's pretty cool um final question about your dad is uh since he's passed how has that altered the way that you parent or that you spend time with your kids or, oh. ha or has it oh. i mean i well, when my dad passed like my the the f having my kids to comfort me and and be there and everything was just no words could explain could could describe how supportive and and necessary for mental health and all that stuff was for just knowing that I've got I have two boys you know and to being knowing that I'll be able to pass you know and just I cherish I cherish every moment with them um and since my dad's passed you know I, people say you know like oh your dad will always be with you and before he passed I was like I kind of don't quite understand that and then once he passed I realized he's with me all the time and even in this interview I imitated him a couple times and he's just like he's there when I need when I haven't when I needed an answer for some things his quotes his words he was very talkative I, I just listened a lot and we drove a lot we drove across the United States a couple times together and he talked a lot and I listened and I asked him all kinds of stories about his youth and you know everything I asked him everything and um so yeah we didn't talk about surfboards at all whose boards are you riding nowadays and what are you interested in uh well Chris Christensen's been my main guy for I wrote I started riding his boards in 2002 then I rode them for like three years and then I rode for Al Merrick for like four years and then I rode went back to Chris so I've had his a relationship with him since 2002 2001 2000 yeah 2001 and um and uh I have a bunch of surfboards from other people because I feel like I learn things from getting surfboards from other, other shapers. And there's so many, the, oh, like I got a board from stretch. I talked to stretch on the phone and I'm just like, wow, he's such a genius. He's so fascinating. Oh, how much he knows. And I learn and I get, I get Intel from that as well as I give feedback um, and I know that that's my currency as a surfer. So I pay for the boards, but, uh, you know, sometimes they give them to me, but I, I don't, I never resell them. I either give them back or, um, or I keep them, you know, and, 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 um, but that's my currency is to give the feedback and say, it works like this. I feel this, I feel that, you know, and I usually have like an idea on where to go next or something just to help and that's what i feel like is a lifeblood for shapers is to get from the surfers a, an idea ah oh, yeah so they go back in the shaping room and and keep progressing with their shapes um i uh i got some um i got i got some boards again from xanadu uh, and i realized after the scott i was really fascinated with the scott bass interview with Xanadu and how he shaped the board and how it was his measurements were like the computer guy and the computer guy came in telling everybody they don't know how to measure a board and I, I just was fascinated I was like no wonder because my I felt like my surfboards in 90 and 91 were the best on tour they were the fastest most vertical most versatile surfer surfboards and everybody wanted one so they started ordering and I and I I realized that he's just an outlier he's just a a, a, a a very 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 passionate so passionate so curious so so many ideas so, you know just you just look at what he's done with his four families and how they relate you're like wow you know he is deep and so i have a history with xanadu and um I just had a strong ego. He has strong ego. And we just, I was just <laughs> like, dude, you know, he was trying to tell me, you know, you need all these flipped noses. And I was like, those are for kids. I don't want a kid's board. I'm a man, you know, and we just had these, you know, arguments and stuff, you know, but never, ever like nothing friendship breaking, you know, 
So we always stay, stayed cordial and stuff. And then the thing I love about Santa is, is my dad and him had words and, you know, it was like they kind of, you know, had some stuff going on. And, but he would always ask me about my dad. Oh, how's your dad? And I always be like, I thought you didn't like my dad. And he was like, no, he told me cause he came to the paddle out and told me that the reason I always ask you about your dad is I just, I, you know, I saw, I saw what your dad was doing. It was business and he was just, his doing his job. He was protecting you. And, and I wished I, I don't have a kind of relationship with my dad and I wished I had one like that with my dad. So I appreciate it, you know, and Interesting. it was cool. It was cool. So I've kind of gone back in a much more humble way to Xanadu. Like you're the master at what you do. And he's the same with me as far as technique. And he saw what my, how my dad was helping me so much. He, he, he knows that I, he knows I know what I'm doing. And he, he, I, I get, I get people coming from him. He tells, he told Gabriel Medina, he's like, you should, you should work with Brad. He's the, he's the best. You should work with Brad, you know? And he just tells his writers, you should work with Brad. If you're smart, you're going to work with Brad. And some come and most don't. And um, so anyway, uh, as, and I got a few boards from guys in Australia. Um, got some boards from, I have a friend, a Japanese friend. And yeah, I just, I got another guy named Luke Daniels. He made, um, made some metricals for me. Mm-hmm. And um, and he's hand shaping and stuff. I, I think when you get a board from somebody, especially if they're going to hand shape, it's almost like a new friend. You 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 get a new friend because you have something in common to talk about, and you get the board. I pay for materials or whatever, or they give it to me. But it's like a lo- it's like a loaner in a way, and I plan on giving it back. Or if I really like it, I can keep it. Kind of, you know, I probably shoot some footage on it and then they get some, you know, but I get a new friend out of it. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It's really cool. And I deserve it after all these years, <laughs> you know, after all these years, I, I, I you know, I, I deserve it. I, I can, I give back. I yeah. give, I don't just take and say, see you later. I, I get it. Then I give back. And, um, I got a board from this guy, Nick Maz, and he makes these micro jet surfboards and they look like the the tail of the board the towards the bottom of the board it goes it actually sticks out mm. and you think it just looks cool so i said i like I, I want one i didn't think it was going to work they, he made me two they both work super good mm. like i'm like wow. wow so i would be interested in getting some boards from like i'd like to get a board from burt burger i tried to talk we talked a little bit just because i want to try the wood mm-hmm. and i see it as i'm now in like now that i'm a teacher and i've got like high level students like i'd like to know i, I got a bunch of pizels because taro writes for pizel and i want to know what does a radius do and what does the shadow do and what does the seven four model do and what does the uh what does the ghost do you know so that i can weigh in when i talk to john pizel about i can it's like a, it, it, it's like the the race car driving coach he he would have a relationship with a mechanic and the driver yeah. and he would understand everything about the car and un, and understand everything about the opponent's cars so that they, they, he could have an so that his driver can have the advantage so i started going well i need to order those boards i need i need to know what they what they do so i have an intuitive connection to my uh to my student and then I have like Skip Fries and I have a Donald Takayama and I have, I've got my 1985 Gary Linden Stubbies board I won. I, ke- I kept my Xanadu that I won the contest on. I have kind of a, I've got like Doc Lausch Cortez Bank model. I've got my Chris Gallagher Toto Santos win 6-4 and Christensen has a Gurr model and he's just updated it and I, like I have a new one and I am so excited about it it works it, it, i'm i had dinner with chris last night i was like dude that board is absolutely magic i love that surfboard and you wrote it today and i wrote it today what is what's the board tell me about the design. it's 510 uh it is swallowtail twin, uh, fin. Uh, twin fin the, the fins are made by duncan ed duncan ed is a a, a guy from torquay he's been making wood fins for 25 years or now 27 i guess and the fins are made 
of all different types of wood based on what you want from the fin. You want more flex or you want them stiffer. He chooses different woods. And um, I have twin fins, quads, single fins, and thruster, all wooden fins. And they are, like, I've got them. They're, like, some of my most prized. I, like, keep them, like, I almost want to put them in a safe because I'm like, oh, where are they? Okay, yeah. there they are. Okay, they're good. They're there, you know. Yeah. And they're fragile. You drop them. You, you go, oh, you know, you, you know they're, they're valuable. So I use Duncan Eady's fins with Chris Christensen's board main, mainly. Uh, the Gur model, and now he's got a Gur model twin, and um, and then I just dabble with other boards, so that even when I weigh in to Chris and I say, "Oh yeah, I you know, I can weigh in and say I like it compared to these other ones. I really like this, or this there's something missing here." And I and as a for Chris, he wants feedback. It doesn't have to be good feedback. Yeah. He wants feedback. And in fact, if I give him only good feedback all the time, he's like, well, I don't know what to do next. Everything seems to work. Nailed it. Moving on. Yeah. Um, do you remember Vice did a video series with you and- Someone playing a banjo now? I don't know. Is, is, that, that, is that your music at the end of the podcast the coming in? outro music. The outro, is the outro music? Is this Roll a, the credits. Is this, is this a hint? <laughs> um, do you remember Vice did a video- maybe a couple of video pieces like a series with you and Christensen riding motorcycles yeah. on the East coast. Uh -huh. That was sick. Yeah. Yeah. It was really fun. I mean, they were doing, there is a series of surf related content that they created, even though you guys didn't really even surf in the piece, it was focused on surfers. Um, we surfed. They, yeah. We had, there was a van. The waves, the waves were super yeah. small, but, yeah. but that, that series that they were doing was killer. Yeah. They only made like eight episodes or something, but it was killer. Man, I forgot about that. Yeah, and I forgot about it until you were just talking about yeah, it. Yeah, we 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 need to we we need to do another one of those. Um, yeah. Or I need to just bust that out and and throw it up on I'll the. I'll put Insta. it on. Yeah, I'll put it on today's uh, episode page. Cool. At any rate, Brad, this has been. Thanks for sharing all this information. It's been killer. Hey, David, I want to say thanks so much for Surf Splendor. I really enjoy the podcast. I learn a lot, and it's been a great contribution to surfing and i and you know i i think that's a for all the goodness that we've got out of surfing we chose a surfer's life to give back this is a great way to give back and to hear people's stories and learn uh, uh learn things to keep surfing's direction going it's, it's, a, it's like there's a certain direction a serving can just get steered off into like weirdness but i think people that have been serving a long time care about serving they weigh in there's checks and balances and it keeps surfing going in the in the direction that maybe it it was the way that we fell in love with it you know it is it, it isn't too far away from the way we fell in love with it. Now there's lots of stuff that, that we're not, we're not in love with, you know, but, but the original, the original like first, you know, spark for me was in 1976 here in Encinitas, you know, and going to the La Paloma theater and seeing buttons and MR and Shane and uh, rabbit and free ride, Sean and, professional surfing it, 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 the, the way that they looked the way they carried themselves it was totally for me i no longer wanted to be a football star or baseball or any major league sport i was like surfing is the coolest thing you can do with your life and i still think it's the coolest thing you can do with your life because you don't have to follow anybody you can do you can chart your own if there's still so much uncharted territory and surfing and that's the thing i learned when i quit the tour is i got i got i got the feeling that i just didn't like what surfing was becoming for me and i didn't know that i could just be like i can just do my own thing mm. i could i i love surfing and no one can take that from me no one's going to take the love of surfing away from me no matter what they do yeah. so i love what you're doing keep doing it um thank you honored to be able to yeah Awesome. Thanks. All right.